welcome, Helen. Welcome back to E-Town. My and, uh, pleasure. Yeah, glad you're here. So, um, your third book, The Newcomers, and, and uh, we can kind of see the thread running through them so far. I mean, let's first actually, if you don't mind, I want to talk about your experience coming uh, with your family to New Jersey. How, how old were you when that happened? Oh, I remember lots because I was one. Yeah. <laughs> You're kind of like me. I was born in another country, but I came when I was two, maybe, or something like that. Um, where were you born? I was born in Beirut, How Lebanon. How do I not know this? So many things you don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I used to make a joke that I said ga ga goo goo with an Irish accent, yeah. but <laughs> Could <laughs> not you tell, really. though, growing up in New Jersey, could you tell that your parents were different or were, were outside of the normal, you know, other parents of, of your kids as you were growing up because of their accents? <laughs> well, my parents were slightly outside the normal because they became hippies in suburban New Jersey. Yeah. They were really excited to be in America. Yeah. They really embraced a lot of what was happening here. Yeah. Um, but that's probably, you were probably asking about their Irish heritage. In a way, <laughs> but any, anything that sort of sets you apart is kind of what defines our childhood. Um, they had Irish accents, and um, I grew up with my mom telling me Irish bedtime stories, which largely consisted of her life on the farm and things like this. Um, so yeah, yeah. And what about unique. The, what about the education piece? Did that come from them, or was that just your natural inclination? Um, our house was filled with books. Yeah. My mom reads fiction. My dad's a nonfiction ad, a diehard uh, advocate and, and reader. And um, they both really valued education tremendously. Um, they were really perplexed when I became an English lit major because, you know, how was I going to earn a living? Yeah. And what did you do if yeah. you just read books? And right. my dad's an engineer. My mom's a nurse. They're very practical people. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've shown them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah. Well, I like the idea that there, the the thread of the of the three books so far really are. Um, it has to do with um, exploring lives um, that we might not otherwise encounter. Um, being, you know, being uh, where we are and, and how we live and where we live. These are all glimpses, for me at least, into um, lives of, of my fellow citizens that I wouldn't otherwise see. And is that driven from your natural sort of journalistic curiosity or is it also your commitment to sort of um, solving this puzzle of um, inequality? I think that it's motivated by uh, feeling I have that there's conversations we have in our country that aren't um, as thoughtful or as deep as I would wish. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I can tell the right nonfiction story, um, I can engage people or interest them in learning more about a subject they might not otherwise know. So, so that leads us right into this subject of the day, which is immigration. It's sort yeah. of something we hear about all the time. Indeed. So um, tell us what, what um, you began to discover. You, you found out about a, Mr. Williams's class at South High School in Denver. That is the place, as I understand it, where it's sort of like a magnet school for non-English speaking um, teenagers who arrive in the Denver metro area and, and they all go, pretty much go there. Yeah, pretty, pretty much that's it. Uh, South is unusual because it's a regular urban high school that serves all the kids that regular uh, big high schools serve, but it also has what's called a newcomer center. And they focus on helping refugee students get settled in their early transition when they're just here, don't have a lot of English, and maybe their schooling has been interrupted by war, other things. Yeah. yeah. So you sat as an observer in this classroom, yep. and it started small and it grew throughout the school year. Yeah, it did, which is strange. You know, most classrooms start around the size they end up at, but this one had five kids at the beginning of the year and 22 by the end of the year because the teacher just collected students as the families arrived in the U.S. Yeah. And um, were, you, were you able to sort of uh, communicate with the kids in the beginning, and, and did you gain access to their, their home lives as well? Well, my attempts to communicate with the kids at the beginning were things like me pantomiming opening a book and trying to pantomime writing by my way of trying to say, hi, I'm a journalist, right. and I might like to write a book about you. Yeah. They didn't get it, did they? I don't think they got much. <laughs> I think they thought there might be a book in yeah. there somewhere. Maybe I was interested in reading. 
maybe right. I wanted them to read. Yeah, yeah. And but but you did you did um, get to know their parents and their circumstances oh, during the course of the year. And and for, in some cases, the parents arrived um, after having, you know, escaped um, from, for example, from the Middle East and maybe migrated from Iraq through Syria into Turkey and then by water and become a refugee in Greece and found their way into. I mean, it really amazing difficult stories. and amazing stories. And then when they arrive here, what did the parents, what were they able to do for income? Because they probably needed to make some money. So what kind of jobs were the parents getting? Well, I want to answer your question about income. But to get to know the kids and their parents, I did ultimately have to hire 14 translators um, to work with because I didn't speak their home languages and they didn't have enough English to communicate with me, at, you know, especially in the early phases. Um, but 14 for, languages. <laughs> There were 22 kids in the room from 11 countries, and yeah. they spoke 14 languages because some of the countries don't have one shared language wow. that everybody speaks. And they also used five alphabets, the kids among them. Amazing. Yep. Wow. They represented the globe, and especially the globe where there's difficulty and conflict and yeah. Amazing. people looking for a new home. So we think of... Um we think of immigration, a lot of people in this country think about immigration, and we think about the wall, or we think about you know whatever it is that uh, is, is a problem, that immigration becomes in some ways a scapegoat for people who are feeling uh, either left out or left behind, or, or in some ways they, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a sad reality that it's become that, but you were able to sort of get beneath that. We've always that. had these currents of very difficult conversations around immigration. I mean, going back sure. whenever we've had big waves of immigration, uh, it's obviously very heated right now. And um, it, as heated as, as I've seen it in my lifetime. And it's uncomfortable, I think, personally, for me and many uh, people, the, the level of the mm -hmm. maybe... Uh, the, the way the turns the political rhetoric has taken. Um, but, you know, this too shall pass. <laughs> well, I think with your help, because... And, and hopefully, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, you tell this story in a completely different way, because now we're automatically going to feel empathy for these families and for these kids, because we understand their struggle, we understand why they're coming here, we understand what they have to do, even once they arrive here. It's not like, therefore, they're all set. It's, it's a, it's, the struggle continues to learn the language, to assimilate, to find employment, to integrate into a, a teenage society. Yeah. You, know. you know, as I was getting to know these kids, really the awe that I felt at um, just how uh, great their struggle was in learning English and trying to become American at the same time, trying to fit in in this high school, trying to figure out what you wear to high school, should they eat spicy chicken in the cafeteria or not, what was spicy chicken, you know, um, and yet their full personalities started to bloom by the end of the year, and the room became this really joy-filled place yeah. where these kids who had been so lonely at the outset, unable to communicate with one another, unable to make friendships, unable to really understand what their teacher was saying, you know, by the end of the year, the kids had grown so tremendously, they had learned so much English so quickly a couple of the kids started reading To Kill a Mockingbird in their second year in the United States. Wow. Extraordinary learning curves. Amazing. Really amazing. Yeah. And it's not easy. I mean, you're, you're a mother of a teenager. You know that just being a teenager <laughs> is hard. It is indeed. And I um, often thought about my son while I was in that classroom uh, watching the struggles that the kids were going through. And I thought about how... Um, relatively easy his life is in the United States compared to some of the countries. Yeah. You know, one of the things that was interesting that I didn't imagine is that technology has allowed some of these kids to stay in touch with their friends from the countries from which they emigrated. So in some cases, um, staying in touch with their friends who were also just behind them, but going through the same harrowing journey that they went through. And it's just it's an amazing idea to think that these kids were in life and death situations as 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds. Yeah. Uh, I know that that's very true, but when you said technology, what I thought about was their use of Google, the Google Translate app on their phone, uh, because they wanted to flirt and invite each other on sleepovers and like 
have fun like teenagers do. So they were using Google Translate like to translate from a language like Karen, which is used in Burma or Myanmar, to say Arabic because that's what the Iraqi sisters in the room spoke, or yeah. a boy from El Salvador who really wanted to propose marriage to one of the girls from Iraq. Anyway, you yeah, get I'd, the idea. I'd like to see some of those Google translations. <laughs> I bet there were some very unusual things were expressed, We didn't get sure. that down in the weeds. <laughs> but again, I think that just the idea to not, not just humanize, but, but create an opportunity for empathy. I think it's something like 42% of those who are illegal immigrants in this country now came through airports and had visas that they overstayed. I mean, it's a pretty significant percentage. And, we tend to sort of think of this immigration issue as being monochromatic, but you just, what you're describing is um, global challenges that set peoples in motion to, for the safety of their families, and that they find themselves on their way here. And, and in general. They do, they do. And you know, I, I hope I can get this point across. It, it resonates for me personally because I grew up with a green card and every time we would come back from Ireland, I was just ridiculously devoted to this particular green card that had a picture of my mom, who looked very young in this photograph, carrying me as a baby. And so I, I refused, even though I was supposed to update my green card, I just didn't. And I got stopped in the airport every time, separated from my family and held for lengthy periods while my mom and my brother and my sister were like, wait, I mean, a minor hassle, right, in the scheme of things compared mm -hmm. to the difficulties that you're talking about. Right. But I, I have this tiny little inkling about what it's like to try to enter this country and travel and um, have some of these journeys that some of these families have. Yeah. And I try to extrapolate from my experience of what that was like, um, you know, uh, visiting relatives in Ireland and always having difficulty coming back in the country because I wouldn't fix my stupid green card. Right. But, um, not, I mean, I just encountered the immigration system in a personal way that always stayed with me and, and made me um, be curious about those who are having even greater difficulties sort of along the same lines. Yeah. And, of course, this leads to, um, you know, the question, are there solutions? Are there political solutions? Can we be doing some diff things differently? And... You were married to a politician for 10 years who was mayor and then governor. Do you have ideas about that? And, and do you get engaged in that conversation now that you've, you've sort of opened the door and, and become in some ways an authority on a, on a small microcosm of what immigration can be and can mean? Do you, do you get now asked to participate in some conversations about policy? Nope. No? <laughs> I'm a storyteller. Sometimes I participate in conversations about policy, but I don't, I'm not somebody who ever is, um, those are casual conversations with people I'm lucky enough to meet as, as traveling in those circles mm -hmm. and, and so forth. But no, I had a clear distinction in my mind. I tell stories, I wanna make people care about these subjects, and I wanna make them care on a deeper level than we do right now. There's so much we don't understand. So I'll just give one example. In immigration, after my first book about undocumented students, I would go around and talk to people, and as I was speaking about the book, just people in the audience would say, so why don't they go get their papers, and can't they hire an attorney, or why don't you tell them to hire an attorney? And I was like, so, do you not understand the basic law that if somebody entered this country illegally, they're not allowed to change their legal status while they're here on US soil? Because that's the basic predicament we've been debating for a decade or so. And how do we not know that basic fact? Mm -hmm. So I want to tell a story where people learn that information. But the fact that so many people in the audience didn't know that basic important fact mm -hmm. about this complicated debate that we have, but we have in a polarized way and yet a superficial way. And we're missing some like key points that are really important for everybody to understand in order right. to like have a more significant debate. I'm trying to improve the debate yeah, well, through storytelling. Other people can set the policy. Yeah, well you've done a great job, not just, not just in uh, highlighting the issue, but in highlighting the, the humanity and the, and the context, providing the context. And for me, understanding just a little tiny bit about what these families have gone through already, what these kids are, are grappling with as they deal with just like uh, the equivalent of another planet. 
and um, still looking for ways to be contributing members of society, which they're well on their way to becoming, thanks to this program. But uh, really, I, I learned a lot from your book, and I appreciate your ongoing effort to shine a light on these, these sort of backstories that, as you say, deepen our understanding and our appreciation for this context of, of these issues that we talk about, but we, we may not really fully understand. So. Thank you. You've done a good job. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the having me. The book is called me. The Newcomers, <laughs> Helen Thorpe's latest. By the way, are you working on a new one? Soon. Soon. You'll be working on another one. Okay. I'm looking for an idea. Okay. Open to suggestions. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Helen Thorpe. Thank you. Author of the book The Newcomers, Chronicling the Lives of Teenagers Coming into the Denver School System.